My name is Thomas Klein Brockhoff. I'm uh, with the German Marshall Fund uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, overseeing uh, the transatlantic and globalization programs, including climate change, at uh, the German Marshall Fund. The first one is the uh, the question of how the so-called Copenhagen Accord uh, that countries, a group of countries, agreed upon last year, and that the uh, conference, the UN conference only acknowledged, now becomes part of the official uh, goals and the official documents of the um, UN convention. That is important because the, the midterm and long-term mitigation goals will be enshrined in that, and with that the world would uh, try to get to a pathway that would allow it to know more uh, warming than two degrees centigrade. So there is the first question about the Copenhagen Accord going forward. The co second question is about the degree of intensity of verification and supervision of climate mitigation that the United Nations could, would be able to conduct in different countries. Here, China is very skeptical. Um, there is a couple of other uh, bigger ones, but those two are probably uh, at, at the forefront of uh, the discussion. Foreseeing what will happen at the next climate conference is a little bit like a crystal ball, but what is clear is uh, the package, the, 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 the fewer outcomes uh, in Cancun has, the bigger the package for, for Durban next year and uh, years ongoing. I think what is clear is that um, the initial idea of having a um, a, an overarching worldwide comprehensive legally binding accord uh, that was supposed to be passed uh, in Copenhagen, this idea on a broad basis failed for many years to come. The negotiations here have been, have been as difficult as they have been in, in, in Copenhagen. The style and the tone and the procedure has been different. People want to uh, uh, want to not to be blamed for the failure, that is evident with the Chinese. Um, and they do want to save the system of multilateralism. That's why they, uh, they, they conduct themselves in a different tone and manner. However, when it comes to the issues, the negotiating about minor details uh, is hard. Uh, and it is very unlikely that for, ye for several years to come, we will have something like, uh, like a global accord. It is hard for people to have to sink in that in Copenhagen that vision failed, and from a from a top down approach uh, of of regulation, uh, the, the the world has changed its approach to a bottom up system of voluntary uh, commitments that are registered in a registry and loosely uh, loosely uh, overviewed and and surveyed by by the United Nations. That is still a very difficult thing for, for nations, especially for Europe, uh, which has been at the forefront of this uh, concept. Europeans love laws and they love top-down legalistic approaches. The world has shown in Copenhagen it isn't ready for it. It is showing in Cancun again it is not ready for it. The question now is whether it is necessary. It is unattainable, as we're seeing every day here. Uh, what is necessary is a global transition to a, a clean energy uh, industry and a clean energy way of life. The question now is how best to achieve that. For 20 years since Kyoto, uh, the negotiations in the run-up to Kyoto uh, folks were concentrated on the top-down approach of, uh, of a legally binding uh, framework. Now that we can't have that, uh, we have to realize that the voluntary commitments that countries are making from their self-interest will not be sufficient to contain uh, the warming of the earth at the scientifically um, defined acceptably level of 1.5, maybe 2 degrees centigrade of warming. Uh, that the world probably could uh, could swallow with too great uh, a damage, uh, but even that is doubtful. So now the question becomes: How do you fill the gap between what people and countries 
are willing and able to do voluntarily to what is scientifically necessary. And that is the question that uh, will be discussed over the next few years. How can international financial institutions uh, channel funds to, uh, to projects that help mitigate the regional developed banks, banks of the UN system are doing that. Uh, the World Bank is doing that. The, uh, the Inter-American Development, to, to name just one example, is planning to change its whole lending capacity uh, to uh, emphasize uh, energy and climate to a dramatically higher extent. They are about at 4 or 5% today. They want to increase that lending for climate and energy for 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 to 25 percent. So at conferences like this, you uh, these are catalytic moments for the world community to drive new ideas, and new instruments. But it is unlikely to have a, a globally binding accord anytime soon. Anyway, if we had an agreement, people would break it. Just remember that the Kyoto Accord only. Uh, only pertained to three dozen countries, and only five of which actually did what they said in the co in, in the agreement. So we need to step back from the inside that an agreement will save the world. We have seen agreements are unattainable, and even if they are attainable, they probably are too weak to 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 do anything. But your question is more towards the actual consequences. The most obvious one of course, is the melting of, of, of the polar ice caps uh, that we're seeing in front of our eyes uh, going on, especially in the Arctic. Uh, the, the, uh, the ice cap in the Himalayan is, is the next uh, one that is underway and not quite as visible yet, but would, would if, if continuing, have dramatic consequences for a major part of a population that is dependent on these, uh, on these water sources. I, I think uh, the even if there is no uh, globally binding agreement, and we we do come to accept the fact that uh, that is that will not be the near term achievable solution for things. I do believe that these uh, climate summits every year have a huge importance. They are the only global uh, event uh, or conference in global governance where science, business, NGO community. Uh, think tanks plus the state's negotiators come together in an osmotic process in which uh, this is the world fair of climate and energy. Everybody globally who has anything to say uh, and think and do on these issues are here. So these conferences have an enormous uh, irrelevance to global capacity building and to the global change of mindset that we're seeing. Uh, when you just look at what has been happening over the last three or four or five um, global conferences that I have witnessed is the mainstreaming of the climate issue to other countries that weren't on the landscape uh, with enormous uh, movements towards a clean, a clean energy economy. Here you can see the United Arab Emirates, who were just oil countries a few uh, a few years ago, changing their approach to energy. Kazakhstan, I learned yesterday, is is thinking about emissions trading, as are some Chinese uh, provinces. Uh, here, this is a huge transmission uh, machine and a, a huge ideas and project generator for mainstreaming um, climate and energy transformation in the world, and it is done through one yearly conference. A second element will be <clears throat> that if and when you have a voluntary system in the future, you will need measurements and standards and some version of, of a voluntary and weak oversight. I can't, uh, I can't think of anybody who would, uh, would be able to do this type of standardization of our approaches better than the United Nations. Now, that is a far cry and a big difference from the global negotiating that is being done now in the future, that then would be a more technical uh, approach to, uh, to the global warming question that the United Nations would see uh, would find a role for itself in. Now, I'm not a natural scientist. I can, uh, I can just repeat what, uh, what, I re what people say and read, but uh, there, there seems to be uh, the, uh, the uh, a widespread agreement 
that uh, once you have melted your, your ice cap, it is very hard and long term to uh, freeze them again. It's not as as if you as if uh, it's not like in your in your refrigerator. If you turn it off uh, one day, uh, you can turn it on the next day, and you will have ice cubes again. That is not the case. So. Uh, it seems from what I understand from scientists is that that triggers a process uh, that can be I either irreversible or be only reversible with a major uh, climate shifts back.